And over the last few weeks, um, we've done a little series of Psalms for the summer. And uh, if you've been here, I hope uh, you have enjoyed that and it's, it's been a blessing to you. And the Psalms are full of all different um, thoughts and feelings and emotions and circumstances. Uh, and so there's always something in there uh, that speaks into our situation. And today uh, we're at Psalm 139, and the first thing uh, that strikes us from that is that God sees everything about me. And in some ways, that's a kind of scary thought, and people kind of react uh, to that, uh, and, and not always positively. It, it's really the first four verses are, are about what theologians call omniscience. God knows everything. And, do you know, it's kind of, hmm, God knows everything. Hebrews uh, chapter 4 verse 13 says this, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare to him who, to whom we must give account. There is no question that God can't answer. There's no problem that confuses him. You, you'll never hear him say, oh, really? He knows. He knows everything about us. He knows when we get up. He knows when we lie down. He knows when we go out. He knows when we go to work. He knows when we make the coffee. He knows when we sit down and play a game on the computer when actually we should be working. He knows. He knows our habits, the good ones and those that are not good. He also knows every word that we say. Verse 4 says, Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. He doesn't just know it after I say it. He knows it before I speak. Now, do you know, you might find that a little bit frustrating. Because if you're like me, you'll have said things that you later regret ever having said. Now, would it not be good in that circumstance because God knows what we're going to say? If he sent a little email and said, David, this Friday, 2.38, shut up. <laughs> Don't speak. Use duct tape if you have to. God. Now, I can just imagine that during this week, somebody's going to send me an email <laughs> saying, <"Go, laughs> David, next Sunday, 11.30, that, that kind of thing. Eh? But God knows what we're going to say even before we say it. He knows our thoughts. He knows what's in our hearts. He knows our motives. He knows the reasons that we do and say things. I want you to think about that just for a moment. See, God knows what you were thinking about there. How do you understand a God who knows everything you've ever thought and everything the person sitting next to you has ever thought and everything that every living human being has ever thought? and will think. That's why David writing this psalm says, it's too wonderful for me. It, it's beyond my comprehension. It's beyond my understanding. God is just too big, and I don't really understand. But if God knows all about me, if he knows what I'm doing, if he knows what I'm thinking, if he knows what I'm saying, what does that mean for me? Well, I actually think it's an encouragement because God is able in all of that to bring things together for good. Human beings are just 
a complete mess of contradictions, sometimes capable of being scared of spiders, and then turning around and doing something wildly heroic. People who one day will, will do something dreadful, and the next day can do something amazingly positive total contradictions. And yet, God is able to work in all of that with us. I think God is also able to help us in our time of, of trial. 2 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. You see, if God didn't know you, if he didn't know how you thought, if he didn't know how you spoke, if he didn't know how you were going to react, how could he do that? How could he stop the temptation being too much? It's because he knows you that you were never tempted beyond what we can bear. He'll also provide a way out so that you can stand up. Because he knows you. Because he knows your limit. That temptation is never allowed to go too far. Now, what you do with the temptation, well, that's your choice, and it's between you and God, whether you give into it or not. But it's never going to be too much for you if in the moment of temptation you turn to God, he'll help you, and you'll overcome. He knows the struggle that we have in our thinking. He's seen it coming, and so he's able to help us in it. This week, it's fairly safe to say you will be tempted. God knows already, and already he is preparing a way out for you. It's up to you to take it. The second thing that we learn is that God is always with me. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what circumstance you find yourself in. God is there with you. That is His promise. And uh, verses, uh, sorry, the second section of this psalm from 7 to 12, it's what theologians call omnipresence. So, we have an omniscience or omniscience, and now it's omnipresence. God is everywhere all the time. Now, uh, how, how does that work? Well, I have no idea. And it doesn't mean that God is stretched out really, really thin, so it's only a tiny little bit of God here and a tiny little bit of God here. No, God is all of God everywhere all the time. So, God right now is here. He wants to speak with us. He wants us to listen to him. But just to try and get a wee bit further in our understanding of that, the nearest star to the earth is four and a half light years away, roughly. If you got on an airplane at Prestwick Airport and flew there, it would only take you 53 billion years. That's like any kind of flight to Magaluf, <laughs> you know. Um, but 53 billion years, it's quite far away. The thing is, the Hubble telescope has sent back images that show galaxies that are 2,000 times further away. The light from those galaxies has taken 7,000 years to get here. And God is there just as much as He's here. What we have as His children is something much more significant than that because God promises His children that He'll not just be beside them 
which he is, he goes with us, but through the Holy Spirit, he lives in us. You don't get closer than that. So, no matter what we're facing, no matter what situation we come across, we can be confident that God is there with us to help us as we go through it. Psalm 34, 18 says this, the Lord is near to those who are discouraged. He saves those who have lost all hope. Well, if you're discouraged this morning, there's good news. Something I can say with complete confidence is that God is with you. If your heart is breaking this morning, then the good news is that the Lord is with you. If you're lonely this morning, then you are not alone because God is with you. If you feel like you've got no idea which direction your life is taking, then you can trust in God because He is with you and He'll guide you through it. That is His promise. You see, if we really understood that God was with us, then we wouldn't need to worry about what's coming up. Because God is with us. And we can trust Him. The third thing that we find is that God made me this way. It's amazing what people do to make themselves look good. Liposuction, implants, facial scrubs, facelifts, nose jobs, tanning beds, body piercings, tattoos. Sam, sorry, Proverbs 31 and 30 says this. Charm can be deceptive and beauty doesn't last. No matter how hard you work at it, beauty doesn't last. 1 Samuel 17 and 7, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, the world, and so often we are part of that, place a huge emphasis on how we look. But God doesn't really care how we look. He made us look that way, and He was pleased when He did it. God looks on what's on the inside, not on the outside. God made you the way you are, and He loves you the way you are. That was His plan, His design for you. You are utterly unique. There's never going to be another you. It's an amazing thing. Nearly seven billion people in the world just now and only one you. You're really special. Really special. Verse 13 of the psalm. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully and wonderfully. We were talking um, yesterday my brother uh, was visiting with his uh, son who is 11 months and they were talking about the fact that they'd had a 4D scan um, when uh, he was just, well, just before he was born. A 4D, I don't even know what that means, but apparently it gives you quite a lot of detail. Here in the womb is this amazing picture of this baby. God did that. God made Luke Look, do you look at the way you're made and say, ha, oh, do you know what? God done good. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Ha, oh, well done, God. Because do you know what? That's what God says. That's what God says when he looks at you. Good job. He could have been American, I suppose, because that's what they say all the time. Do you know? <laughs> Good job. Right? But, but, do you know, that's, that's the truth of the thing, that God looks at you and says, I did well. You're amazing. Not many of us actually get that excited about the way God has made us. In fact, very often, 
we are critical of ourselves, of our behavior, our attitudes, the way that we look, and we often put ourselves down. Maybe you don't say it out loud. And, and maybe you walk in here Sunday by Sunday smiling and doing what we traditionally do in church and say, I'm fine. How are you? Fine. Mm -hmm. But actually, maybe what you're saying is, well, I'm fat or I'm stupid or I'm ugly or I'm slow. I'm not a very nice person. I'm a terrible Christian. And God wants you to stop that because it's not true. When we do that, actually what we're doing is pointing to Him. When, when we say to ourselves, I'm worthless, I'm no good, I can't do anything, actually what you're really saying is, God, you messed up when you made me. You got it wrong. And God says, no, I didn't. I got it right. God says, I created you just the way I wanted to. You just need to work out how much I love you and what my purpose for you is. You see, you are a marvelous creation and you're designed by God. God has a plan for your life. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's workmanship created to do good works. And then Ephesians at chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, it's in Christ that we find out who we are. It's in Christ that we find out who you are. If you want to know the purpose for your life, then you need to ask God to reveal it. You need to come to Jesus and say, do you know what? I can't do this on my own. I need you to help me. I give you my life. Will you give me my purpose? It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, He had His eye on us had designed in us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. We were created for a purpose. God knew us before we were born and had already prepared things for us to do. We find our true purpose in Jesus. When we choose to follow him, God enables us to find out the reason that we're here. I have no doubt that I'm meant to be here. It took a long time and was a, a circuitous route. Years of saying, I'm never going to be a minister. But this is actually really encouraging. Because when you know where you're meant to be and you know what you're meant to be doing, and you God, then where you're meant to be, Do you know what God's purpose for your life is? Make you, equip you, Thank you.